Hello, and welcome to the Millennial Nutritionist Podcast. I'm Isla Garcia, Master's Degree of Nutrition Science and Registered Dietitian, and I'm going to make weight loss realistic, sustainable, and uncomplicated for your busy lifestyle. On this podcast, me and my team of registered dietitians will decipher the latest nutrition research, dissect bad diets, and discuss social media trends for you so you can feel confident knowing what to eat to achieve your health goals. Research suggests that most weight loss programs aren't successful, but my experience has taught me that this is not because the participants aren't committed. It's because those diets are designed by non-nutrition professionals and center around severe restrictions. We are here to provide the facts about the science of weight loss so you can have the success you want and continue living your best life. Welcome back to the Millennial Nutritionist Podcast. It's Isla, your host, your founder and CEO of the Millennial Nutritionist. And today I have another exciting guest with me. She went to undergrad with me, but we kind of reconnected after. um, And she's going to talk about an exciting topic about kind of the food culture and health culture in Costa Rica. They have done a lot of research and it's a super healthy, one of the most healthy um, countries. And then like a specific area in the country is one of the hot spots for the people that live the longest there. So without further ado, thank you for joining us, Angie. I'm going to have you pronounce your whole name so I don't botch it. Yeah. Thank you, Isla. I'm so excited to, to be on your podcast and excited to talk about Costa Rica and, and the culture itself. Like you mentioned, my name is Angie Ramkalawan and I am um, in Raleigh and I'm currently doing project management and uh, IT software company. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about yourself before we dive in, um, because you were also a further um, fellow millennial. So um, super relatable for everybody who's listening. Um, yes. Tell us um, when did you kind of like come to the U S what brought you to Meredith? Why, what did you study? Um, kind of all of those things leading up to kind of where you are now. Fun fact, I was actually born in Canada. So most people don't know that. And when we were, when I was one, we moved to Costa Rica because my mom is originally from Costa Rica and she wanted to go back home. So I was in Costa Rica until I turned 11. And then we moved here around in 2003. My dad had a job opportunity and he really wanted to bring the whole family so that we could be exposed to another culture because that was important to him. And really stayed in North Carolina ever since. Like you mentioned, I went to Meredith College where we met. You're part of my little sis class and started business administration, went into project management consulting after graduation, and then decided to take a step back from all the travel and went into project management and staying in Raleigh. Gotcha. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And you still live there. I know you still hang out with like all of your friends. I was like, went back and told all my friends, um, how like jealous I was that all of your friends, um, like stay so close and y'all are even going on a trip to Portugal tomorrow. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so for a big birthday, we're all going to Portugal tomorrow for a week. So super excited about that. And again, I'm a big foodie, so excited to try new food and, and all the wine and we're, we're so pumped. Yeah, we just had a coach, actually, one of our coaches on our team. She just went to Portugal. Um, Catherine actually went to Meredith, too. I don't know if you would have known her. She was a year younger than me. Um, And I was actually supposed to go there for my honeymoon. I was like one of the COVID brides that we got married like the month right after COVID was a thing. And we were supposed to go there. And so I'm always like super jealous because I did so much research. And I feel like it's a country that not a whole lot of people talk about. Um, So where are y'all going in there? So we're going to do Lisbon and then going down south to Lagos and then up north to Porto. We're actually renting a car and just kind of doing a road trip, which should be super fun. It's a, yeah, it's a kind of like off the beaten path, I guess, because most people tend to go to Spain or Italy, kind of like the, the more common ones. So I will come back with a full review, I'm sure, of how it goes. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, we can kind of dive into the topic here. So, um, if everybody doesn't know, kind of the reason we're picking Costa Rica to look at today is because, um, there's kind of this famous study that spurred into a man's like personal interest and also had more studies from it. And the whole thing is kind of called the blue zones project. And, um, where they started is looking at areas of the world where people live the longest. Um, cause 
when it comes to nutritional studies, it's best to look at studies where we look at somebody's whole life and especially like a whole population of people, because it's never like just nutrition that really helps with overall health, right? Like we want to think of everything possible. And because it's so hard to pinpoint what somebody ate like five years ago and how it's playing out now, we just more so look at large populations of people and what they all have in common. So they started finding um, this place in Sardinia where people were living like crazy amounts of time. It was something crazy. Like most people live there to 90 and were super active, um, not like 90 and like kind of decrepit and sick and living in an old folks home. Like they were still farming and stuff like that. And so they went to see if they could find more regions where this was a thing. And one region was in Costa Rica, which I was really surprised about because I don't know if I had never heard of it. I'm not really sure why I was like, why I was so like, I like messaged you right away. I was like, oh my gosh, I know Angie, she can help me. Like, did you know this? Um, and the, the area is the peninsula. You might have a better job of um, pronouncing this. Is it Nicoya? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Good, good. Um, so Nicoya is the peninsula, peninsula that um, has where the people kind of live the longest in Costa Rica or even like all over the world. But then I was doing further digging and to see how the rest of the country stacked up. And it was still really impressive with the healthcare that they have in place. And even just like the principles overall that they have better health outcomes compared to Americans, despite not being at like a higher socioeconomic status, I guess, as the whole country. So it kind of de um, like uh, debunks the whole like well, you kind of need money to be healthy when this whole country does so well, despite um, like compared to America. Um, did you like have any initial thoughts when you even like saw about that? Or were you like, oh yeah, like that's, I, that totally makes sense for me. I thought that made sense. Honestly, just living in, in a majority of my life kind of on both places. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., we eat a lot of processed food. We eat out a lot. We go to restaurants, a lot of frozen meals. And growing up in Costa Rica, you didn't do that, right? A lot of it was going to the to the fresh market and getting a lot of vegetables and fruits and cooking at home. So much of it was having those sit down meals with your family. And you really went out to eat when it was someone's birthday or a graduation or like an, a reason to celebrate. So I think that's kind of like the main contrast that I saw between the two. I, I didn't grow up with like any microwavable meals or frozen meals. We really didn't like use our freezer that much because everything's so fresh and you're getting it from right there. The, the access to the produce it's it's so available and also so cheap so you're going to lean towards that versus going out to eat especially we are a family of six I have three siblings then my mom and dad so taking a family of six out to eat it, it's going to get expensive versus you can make a really healthy meal at home gotcha gotcha okay yeah so um overall kind of saying that eating like more meals from scratch, whether it's like probably the uh, less portion size, the better ingredients, probably like forcing you to have more like fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. Less processed food is one of the biggest differences that you notice. Is that what you're saying? Yes, absolutely. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So let's dig in a little bit more to what are the differences that you saw maybe in like your initial transition? So um, first, can you kind of tell us like, what was that transition like? I guess when you moved from Costa Rica to the US, like were you surprised about anything in general, not even just the food? I don't know if I was necessarily surprised about anything. I was 11. So I was just so excited to be in the U.S. and kind of we were we were all together. So I think that would have been different if kind of like your family split. So we were all here and I was excited to see snow kind of for the first time as well. So I just remember it all being really fun. I think the, in Costa Rica, they also teach you English starting in first grade. So mm -hmm. I had my basic English already. So that that makes school easier as well. I'm sure that if I knew no English, that might have been, made the transition a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. I do remember, well, the, the cafeteria was interesting because the food wasn't food that you would eat in a cafeteria in Costa Rica. So even a cafeteria in Costa Rica is homemade meals. Like you have cooks back there making like ACP that day or they're making rice beans and a salad and that's what everyone's having for lunch. So that was the transition. The cafeteria was always kind of tricky. And then there are some cultural differences of just, I, I went to Cary, I went to Davis Drive. So it was very stark of, you know, you have the new foreign girl kind of uh, in sixth grade, which is already, I mean, middle school is a tough time for everyone. So I think that was just a, a year, kind of that transition period, but overall, I feel like North Carolina was welcoming and the fact that 
we were in Cary, it didn't feel, I think it would have been different if we were going to Chicago or New York, like a really big city. I think mm-hmm. that would have been more shocking than living in Cary, North Carolina. Gotcha. Gotcha. But gosh, did you miss like, I have been to Costa Rica one time, I guess I should have prefaced like, I feel like it's like an obligatory high school trip <laughs> that you take. Um, and um, it's just so lush and green there. Like, was that, or were you feel like you're probably just too little to like miss it? Or like, do you ever miss that part? Cause I feel like that is just so beautiful there. It is gorgeous. I'm, I feel privileged that I'm able to travel a lot. I do go back like two or three times a year. What I miss is my family. We are really family oriented. And even when I was at Meredith, like I went home on Sundays to see my family wow. and like go to church with them. So those are the kind of things that I miss, like celebrating every birthday together. That that family aspect has, has been tough. And they've been, they moved back five years ago after my dad retired. And it still feels like they left last week. It's, it's hard every day. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Do you feel like you're tired of trying every new diet out there whenever you're ready to lose weight, but you never really find long-term success because it's either too restrictive or just not conducive to your lifestyle? Well, then let me tell you about our three-month lifestyle reset program. This is an individualized weight loss approach where you'll be going through our proven six-step method and you'll be led by a registered dietitian. By becoming a client of the program, you'll be able to learn how to control your weight, increase your energy and confidence, and also improve your overall well-being. Not to be dramatic, but a lot of clients tell us that they actually change their lives by going through the program and finally find a sustainable weight loss solution when they actually haven't found that with any other program. If you are interested in becoming a client, Sign up for a discovery call on our website, themillennialnutritionist.com with me, Isla Garcia, and I'll help match you with one of our registered dietitian coaches based off of your challenges and their nutrition expertise. If you're ready to find a sustainable weight loss solution in a non-judgmental and encouraging environment, I hope you'll connect with us soon. even now like any more like differences that you notice in like health or like overall quality of life when it comes to like the Costa Rican lifestyle versus the U.S. Yeah I think in in general in the U.S. and it's a big country so it's hard to like generalize but I think we're more we're more sedentary Mm-hmm. Maybe we were in Denver or something. It might be different, but mm-hmm. at least in North Carolina, when the winter comes, everyone's inside, you're cold, you're mm-hmm. eating a lot of comfort foods, and then you kind of ramp back up to the summer and everyone's kind of getting ready for summer. So I think that's kind of a, a really big difference. I think we're more stressed in general. Is that I'm, I am in the corporate environment, so maybe it's a big corporate environment or I think in in general, the U.S. is more focused in working versus the Costa Rican culture is really focused on family and you just have to work as well, right, Mm -hmm. to to like pay for things. So I think it's that that change of mentality as well. The differences of in Costa Rica, I think I'm sure you read like the Pura Vida uh, saying, which is pure life. You're just kind of everyone's very relaxed and more easygoing. We're also, everyone's also late 15 minutes. Cause I think that's also part of the culture of, of being so relaxed. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I feel like one thing I've definitely learned from, I think working even just like in weight loss for so long, um, is that stress, I feel like is for sure a silent killer that people don't talk about. And when Absolutely. I always look at these like studies of other countries, one thing that they all have in common, they like the researchers really do say is like the lack of stress that a lot of people have, um, really helps with everything. It helps with probably less emotional eating. It helps with mental health. It helps with getting your hormones in balance. So it sounds like you're kind of like talking about that too. It's just like the values are different. And then like, yeah, being sedentary, that is one thing that they also found is that um, people in all of these countries in Costa Rica too, um, they walk a lot more places and a lot of their life is just like built like that. Was that the same for you, even though you were you in like more of a city or where exactly were you from? I would call it the suburbs. We okay. lived in a gated neighborhood and you walk mm-hmm. to school every day because it was only like two blocks away. Mm-hmm. So you also leverage a lot of public transportation. So mm-hmm. they're not going to drop you off in front of your house. You're going to walk again. You're going to walk a little bit to mm-hmm. get to the bus stop or get to the taxis and so on. So I think the leveraging of public transportation and just it's really good weather. So mm-hmm. you're more likely to walk when it's 75 and 50% humidity 
versus 105 and 100% humidity. That's just very uncomfortable. Or when it's freezing cold, you're going to get in your car. And even if you're just going to a grocery store, you might just drive there because it's easier, more convenient. So I think the fact that Costa Rica has that great year on weather, people are more likely to walk, you're more likely to have that cookout outside, think nice, I would say like September weather year round, like North Carolina September weather is kind of what we're, we were exposed to. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I wanted to ask like, what do you feel like is the reason? Cause it's not like you're saying you're like, that was like a village where people literally were still like walking every day. Like if you're going from one city to still like a, Raleigh's not like the biggest city in the world. Um, like, what do you feel like that main difference is there that causes the more walking in Costa Rica? But it sounds like you're saying it's really the weather. Is that what you're saying? I, yeah. I think the weather plays a big role into what the ability of the things that you do on a regular basis, just like sitting outside, cooking, spending time with family versus it's November, it's freezing cold, you're inside maybe eating potatoes and mac and cheese because that's kind of like the comfort food that you're feeling or what's in season. It's hard to get really good kale Mm -hmm. if it's December versus if it's May. So I think that also impacts like the vegetables that you're eating throughout throughout the year in the U.S. because it might not be seasoned. Yeah, that is one thing that they also found in the study as well um, that you're kind of speaking to. They found, they said that the weather in all these places they found were like just more conducive to being outside, more vitamin D, which helps your mood, it helps your bones. Like being outside is just helpful in so many different ways. Um, So kind of like running through this list of like highlights that they found in the study were the reasons that Costa Ricans, even specifically this area, Nicoya was um, for the people that live so long and were living so long in a very healthy way um, are as follows. And I wanted to see what your opinion was on these, if you have anything else to add. So one thing that they added that I had never heard of was I have heard of Pura Vida, but not this Plan de Vida. Have you heard of that? So there's like strong reason to live. Um, they found within Costa Ricans causes people to just have a better like mood overall, whether it's a reason to live for their family or a reason to live for their job, as opposed to Americans, I guess, don't have that. Did you see that at all ever? I've never heard the term specifically, if I'm being honest, but I do think that there is, it's a more purposeful living and it's very family focused so your social life revolves around your family if you're celebrating again you're inviting family and friends like so much of that you have this really strong community and support system and I think that just brings you so much joy every time I go I come back like glowing and I think it's from just getting all of that exposure to family and and spending time with them I I think that purpose plays a big role in how you live versus just going day by day Maybe yeah. look forward to a vacation, but that could be three months from now and you just kind of years go by and you're not sure why. Yeah, definitely. And when we think about um, kind of like I have six fundamental steps in my program um, and this, I think, which I don't know if this is really even in our scope because it's not nutrition, but what I see a lot is when people like are emotionally eating, a lot of times it's because they feel bored or lonely or disconnected. And um, a a reason that um, Costa Ricans might not have that issue as much um, or like being able to maintain their weight a little bit better maybe is because they are able to have that. They have more community connections. They have more, um, you know, things to keep themselves entertained besides just being alone by themselves and eating a lot of food. Do you feel like that's like kind of what you're saying too? Yeah, I think having that support kind of community prevents you from like you're saying, I'm really stressed or I'm really sad I'm going to sit at home and Netflix and bench eat xyz right instead you might like get together with some friends and do something or go to a park and hang out again spending a lot of that time outside versus just kind of bench watching tv and eating which I think it happens to all of us, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, and at the end here, I want to kind of like piece this together. So for what's applicable. So as we kind of go through this list, don't think it's like totally unachievable. We're going to piece this together because since Andrew kind of lives in both places. Um, what about, they did accredit a lot of the health to one diet component, um, which is being like a mostly vegetarian and minimally processed um, diet overall. They didn't, they said for all of these cultures, it's not like they don't eat meat, but it might not be as common. And I when I I was there. I guess I didn't think about that. I did eat mostly vegetarian when I was there just because it was so good. I really love rice and beans and the cheese. I've never found that cheese anywhere. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, like the white block cheese that I would get with some meals. Um, did you find this too, where you live that it was more like vegetables were more celebrated or what are you, what is your kind of like commentary on that? Yeah. I mean, all our plates are so colorful. 
That's mm-hmm. kind of the main component. And then me is a side instead of being half the plate. So mm-hmm. it wasn't until I came to the US that I saw like plates with steak, like a huge steak on it. Like that just isn't what you're going to see or cheeseburgers where you get like a pound. That's just not part of how we eat. So I think it's a lot of it, like you were saying, a lot of the the colorful plates, lots of vegetable, lots of fruit, like a lot of the things that I know y'all teach in, in your program, right? And I now have to follow a pescatarian diet just because I feel my best. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes I have Chick-fil-A because when you have a craving, you've got to go with what your body's telling you. But yeah. for the most part, I just feel my best. And I think my body has really thanked me after kind of leaning more towards the, the vegetables and fruits. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so kind of like building off of that, can you tell us, cause I even tried to look this up online and I couldn't even find it. Cause now I'm like obsessed and I want to eat just like the Costa Rican diet to feel like uh, how they feel. But so what would be an example day of like breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And like, is there snacks? Is there desserts? Is there alcohol? Like, what would that look like for us? Definitely always breakfast in the morning. That's just not a meal that you skip coffee we we love coffee so you're gonna have coffee in the morning and then coffee at 3 p.m uh lunch is the biggest meal so that's when you you're gonna have um, a larger size portion a snack usually with that coffee at 3 p.m and then you're gonna have a lighter dinner that sometimes could be leftovers from lunch depending on kind of how you cooked we are not a big dessert uh, culture like I always saw it in movies how people were like what's for dessert and you just you just didn't get dessert so uh, we didn't have a lot of dessert and in my household we were big drinkers like I never saw my parents have more than two drinks so I think that could also be part of the culture or it could also be a, um, a home kind of lifestyle Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And that's exactly what they found in the study too. So I'm glad that that checks out. They said, um, with all of these cultures that are all of these countries eating like a larger dinner, I mean, a larger breakfast, kind of like maybe a larger medium lunch and then a smaller dinner, um, was like very common for all of these, which is really interesting because so many people skip, um, breakfast now. Um, what about like specifics of what would be in the meals? The base of the, usually the lunch and dinner are going to be rice and beans. And sometimes you even have rice and beans for breakfast. It's called gallo pinto. And it sounds off, but it really comes together when you put like scrambled eggs and plantains. So you're getting kind of like really good fiber. You're getting your carbs and then you're getting a protein from the eggs or the cheese maybe. And then plantains, you're also getting some more carbs as well. So, and then for lunch and dinner, you're going to have again, rice, beans, a salad, and then some kind of protein, depending on what you're looking for. So I always felt, and we call that um, casado. So a lot of times when you go to a restaurant, they're always going to have a casado and you can switch out the type of protein. So you can do beef or chicken, or they'll have grilled fish as well, or breaded fish. So that would, I would consider the, the most common meal that you'll find. And you just kind of switch out the, the different ways of, of how you do it or, or put it together. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So yeah, the rice and beans. Yeah. I remember having the rice and beans for breakfast. I actually thought it was really good. Yeah. With the egg, it tastes good with the fruit. It's really filling. Um, and yeah, just like you said, you're getting all those like beautiful components there. Um, what about like who cooks the meals? Cause I know like a lot of our clients and Americans in general, there's also this problem of like no time because you're working so much and you have to do all these things. Like, is there still like the big stay at home mom or is it like Somehow do y'all like have a hack on who makes the food? Like, how does that work? Because if you're preparing all this homemade food, I'd assume that takes a lot of time. Yeah, it it definitely takes a lot of time. When we lived in Costa Rica, we did have help. So we had a maid that would come help and cook uh, the lunch. And then my mom would cook the dinner with us. When we moved to the U.S., we didn't have help. My mom would make the meals and she just worked part time Mm -hmm. and I am grateful that she did this because she would always call my sister and I, which were the oldest of the four, to come help with dinner. So like mom would be cutting the onions and the mom would be starting the rice or starting the beans or defrosting whatever chicken we were going to eat. And I think that is something that I have brought into my life now because I'm like, cooking dinner is such a big component of like every day and excited to like try a new recipe and you know, you get some weird vegetable that you want to try to make a meal together with it. So I think that's something that I've brought in, uh, in kind of what the, what the day looked like when you were making, making the whole foods at home. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Sometimes I have to have those like heart to heart with clients of like, 
sometimes like we can find a lot of hacks for things, but sometimes like there's a reason that we're kind of aging more unhealthfully because we're taking away some of those practices that are so important to help with portion control, to help with actually knowing what's in your food. So, you know, that there's not some ton of oil or sugar, you know, it's all that stuff when you don't make it, um, which also helps with activity, You're more active when you cook. So that's awesome that you've been able to um, keep that up. What about, so is the coffee sweetened or not? I'm always curious, like, does everybody drink black coffee? No, I think they do put sugar in it. I don't put sugar in my coffee, but I love like a splash of like almond milk or something in there to, to help it. But it's usually with sugar or I guess just sugar. Yeah. Okay. Sugar or black. Okay. Okay. What about, are there there any other different types of, I guess, specifically like fruits and vegetables that would be commonly eaten there compared to here? um, Or is it pretty much the same? I think it's pretty much the same. A lot of it is the quality that you're going to get. So maybe you come across a papaya in here, Teeter, and you eat it and it's kind of bland and kind of hard. But in Costa Rica, everything just like kind of melts in your mouth. It's like, it's so sugary, I guess, just because it's local and, mm-hmm. and it's a local produce from it. So, and everything's more widely available, right? Like you, watermelon is only seasonal here versus in Costa Rica, you're going to get watermelon, pineapple. Mm-hmm. I mean, every time I go, I just go to the big farmer's market and I'm like going to each stand and trying all the fruit. Cause I'm like, I can't believe they have it all today here right now. And you can just kind of buy it. So there are some interesting things um, like mamoncino and some other types of fruits that you wouldn't see. And I think that would be the same. Like if you go to Thailand and mm-hmm. there's certain like dragon fruit that they have, we could go find it at an Asian market, but it's just not as easy to find them, the other fruits. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So just more of it. Um, yeah, I think when I was there, um, I didn't notice anything that I didn't, um, find at home really either. Again, there was like a cheese that I love that I can't find. Um, but with the fruits, yeah, the papaya, I remember I didn't normally like papaya, but when I was there, it tastes so good. And I came back and I tried to have it here and it tastes awful. I don't really know yeah, anyone who eats it. <laughs> Not the same. <laughs> um, okay. So kind of the next thing that they looked at was exercise. And I think we already kind of touched on this some, but I'm always curious to like, is there a, like a gym culture there or is there a, um, is it just that everybody's just like naturally active? Like what about that aspect? The gym culture is not as big there as it is here. It's mm-hmm. definitely picking up more, especially with the, the big focus on weightlifting. So people have started doing that. I know my siblings go to the gym and actually my little sister is in the Olympic powerlifting team. Wow. So that, that's a big focus in our household. But I think going to a gym would be more of like a privilege because not every apartment complex is going to have a gym. Not every neighborhood is going to have a gym. So you would have to travel to go to the gym. And as we know, and I think you've talked about this, if if the exercise you're going to do is really far away, you're less likely to do it. So I think it's more around the active lifestyles, doing a lot of your chores, running errands, walking around the neighborhoods, walking to and from work or school that would contribute to that overall, just getting a lot of steps in and, and staying uh, healthy. Yeah, no, I think a lot of people really... Um don't put a lot of value to that many steps in a day, but I find that I don't think I've had, I think I've had like one client and all the clients I've ever seen that already walk 10,000 steps a day. So that is one really easy thing you can do. But a lot of it um, that they found in the studies is that a lot of people's life is just like more set up in these areas um, around walking. So whether it's the whole culture walk. So like they're more encouraged because instead of maybe going out to eat, like they just have to walk with their friends or something, or like there's less conveniences like that we have in America. So you have to walk to it. Or like you said, public transportation, you're still gonna have to walk a little bit because it's not your own car. Um, So that's, that's how they found it was like easier in those countries kind of compared to here in the U S. But that is very interesting because when we had our other guests on for the French podcast, they said the same thing that they're like, it's way, it seems to be like way more extreme here in the U S with like nobody it's, it's either you're like not really active at all or you're like a gym buff where it seems like in France, it was like very middle ground. Like everybody's just like relatively active through walking. Do you feel like it's kind of the same or is it completely different? I, I would agree with that. I definitely see it in the US. Like you have like, you don't do anything at all or you're at the gym six days a week or you're a big marathon runner. So I feel like there's a really big gap mm-hmm. between between the two types of lifestyles. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So then the kind of the last thing that they found or that I found was interesting that I want to discuss with you was 
um, because Costa Rica is in Central American, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess compared to a lot of the other Central American countries, the, the literacy rate and the education rate is so high in Costa Rica. And, and maybe you wouldn't know this since you moved here when you were younger, but do you know anything about like how the like education system works there? Or can you even, have you noticed that um, children there are more educated? Um, Cause that's what they also found was important for improving the health overall. When we think of some of these more like baseline health measures, like wash your hands and stuff like that. A lot of that comes with increased education. And then apparently in Costa Rica, they found that it was a 97% literacy rate for the whole country. Do you see that a lot? Like a more, a bigger emphasis on education? Yeah, absolutely. They, they put a big focus on that. And I think that it really made Costa Rica excel from all the countries in Central America. You'll know that Costa Rica is now a developing country, which is kind of like out of um, the, in comparison to the other countries in the area. They also start teaching you English in first grade. So that really affects your chances or options that you're gonna have after you go to school too. We also have an area in Costa Rica very similar to RTP where you have IBM and Cisco and a lot of American countries that have set up shop there too. So you're getting out of college and then you have options as well to get a job and leverage a lot of that education that you got as well as the English that you learned. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that was like a major difference they found. And I think they even found that. I guess over the past like 100 years or so that they used to have more problems like a long time ago with like the basic health problems like malaria and like um, like bad things in the water and stuff like that. And they made a lot of improvements through public health to improve all that, along with really improving the education system, which is which is awesome um, that you're able to have like both components while still not have this like huge emphasis on like stress and productivity, like in the U S do you know at all why like Costa Rica never really got like that? Cause I honestly feel like that's like kind of the root of all evil here in the U S I think that the, in the U S we're a capitalist country, right? So I think that really drives, it's more money driven, more class driven versus again in Costa Rica, you're kind of focusing on your family, my mom comes, she's one of 10 kids and my grandparents, my grandma's 90, she's turning 91 next month. And then my grandpa's 89 and they live in this little ranch in the mountains and he has goats and she has her garden. And I think the fact that like we talked about the staying really active, they tend for their own gardens. Uh, they live by themselves with, with some help, but I think that that is such a, a big difference to some people that are living here at 91, maybe if, if you make it to maybe living in a home where you're sitting all day watching TV, playing cards or bingo once a, a week versus outside doing things, uh, doing your own chores. I think that really changes, uh, changes how long you live or how well you live too. Oh yeah, for sure. One of your main objectives, right? It's like, let's stay healthy to live a better life. Yes. Or as long as can. Exactly, exactly. Because that's one thing is we don't want to just live to 90 and like be like brain dead or something. We want to like be active. And that's one thing also they found in the study that even though, I mean, people are living so long in Costa Rica and they're living a good long life. It's not like, yeah, they're just like in a wheelchair, they're active. They're able to still enjoy their life at that age. So that's awesome that you're like kind of grandparents are a testament to that. Like, what do you feel like are some of the biggest differences between the U.S. and Costa Rica for like overall health? Or even like, do you feel like this has like impact you differently from um, in the U.S.? Like if you would have stayed in Costa Rica, do you think that anything would have been majorly different than you like growing up half your life here? Yeah. So I did mention I was able to bring and keep some of the, the good things I learned with like cooking meals at home and going out to celebrate. I think there are some things that I would say negatively impacted me from the the maybe U.S. culture was uh, I think the first thing is the diet culture, the fat diets. It's I remember in high school and college, unfortunately, I tried them all because you were always kind of told that you were supposed to be smaller or lose weight. So I always thought there was weight to lose. Mm -hmm. So I think moving away from from that has taken me years, but that's something that is still engraved on us and something that I know you fight against of let's make long lifestyle choices, changes to have sustained a sustained weight or so on. So I think that would be the, the, the first thing. And then the other thing, and I think this is part of the fact that we have, at least in North Carolina, four seasons, is that you are getting air quotes, beach ready or summer ready, and then you fall off the wagon in the holidays, but then you're back on it in January. That, again, it's taken me years to move away from and just 
keeping a good eating habit and exercise to feel good. And if I look good, that's like a plus on top of it, but that's not necessarily the good. The goal is just to stay healthy. I think that's another thing that I have felt that happens a lot of here just because um, of the summer, winter and so on. So you're saying that um, like over like an overemphasis on like how to improve health, but it like it not coming from like valid resource places or it not even being like the right information has kind of put this like unneeded stress on how you view like nutrition and health overall. Is that kind of like what you're saying, how it impacted you negatively? I would I would say so. And now having to kind of really learn or relearn those those old habits to understand what kind of what a, a good healthy lifestyle would look like. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, and then to kind of like wrap it all up here for everyone, let's kind of think about what is achievable for people who listen, who are not living in Costa Rica. So let's start with like, can you let us know, like, is there anything that you feel like as, um, somebody who's able to have that influence in their life, living in Costa Rica, this area that's so healthy, are there any things that you feel like do you, you did carry with you um, that kind of set you apart from like the typical American or just something that you've learned that you try to continue to carry with you in like American society to stay healthy? Yeah, I think the first thing is cooking at home. And I know it takes a little bit of homework and definitely a little bit of time to set yourself up. But I think that would be the first time. The first thing is cooking at home, maybe even setting a menu. I do this every week. That way I know when I'm cooking that evening and it's not a really stressful thing. And then having those groceries and produce at home so that you don't lean towards just getting Uber Eats or getting takeout and then not feeling so great after eating all that food would be the next thing. So take Digging into that cooking part again a little bit more, because the, the biggest complaint I hear from people um, is that they just have no time. So like, how do you personally manage your time? Because I guess I should have said this at the beginning, we kind of reconnected because we would go to the same gym like every morning. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that you live a super healthy lifestyle. So how do you manage that time as a working millennial in the U.S. to still like cook your meals? It's setting that menu so that when I go to the grocery store, I'm getting everything I need to be able to fix up those those recipes. And then what I use my Insta pot, like I'll make a big thing of black beans and keep them in the fridge. I make a big thing of garbanzo beans and keep them in the fridge. So doing whatever prep I can do so that some of those meals like will be a one pot meal and you just put everything together. And what my partner and I do is we actually make a really big dinner and then we save though the extra for lunch the next day. So we already have the next day's meal. And then sometimes if we made too much, like a pasta dish or something that makes a lot, we'll freeze that and label it so that if there's a day, I mean, some days we're tired, maybe it's a Thursday night and you've had a tough week, you can take out a frozen meal, let it be thaw, and you have something healthy and nutritional to eat after a long, hard day. Yeah, I think that's great. I think um, that's a really easy one for people to know how to do is like just embrace those leftovers. You can even repurpose meals. Like you said, a lot of our clients, they'll even do the whole like where they make some ground meat at the beginning of the week and repurpose it in many different things. So you could easily do that with the beans too. Um, I feel like something else that I kind of want to bring out that you're not really saying, but you are kind of saying is like embracing more of maybe like more fruits and vegetables, like overall, because you having a more pescatarian diet, I'm sure that you eat more fruits and vegetables compared to just not. Um, do you feel like you do? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, all our meals are vegetables for the most part, right? So learn and learning your vegetables, right? So some are more carb heavy, more some are more fiber, and still what I'm not gonna eat potatoes every day. That wouldn't be fulfilling and it would be kind of plain. So playing around with all the different vegetables, having a lot of color, carrots, Brussels sprouts, all the different things to kind of um, still kind of change it up. And then fruits like I'm going to reach for like an apple or an or an orange for like that afternoon kind of like you're kind of craving sugar, but you don't really want to go down the path of anything else. So having all those things at home makes you reach for that orange and instead of maybe running out to get chocolate or something that you wouldn't have on a normal day. Yeah, for sure. For sure. A lot of times people have cravings, but they don't realize they're really just hungry. So just eat something a little bit lower calorie, like a fruit or vegetable. And then the other two things I feel like you're exuding that they talk about in this study is still a close connection to your family. Um, Like I was talking about with my mom last night, this, what we were doing this. So I was excited. And she's like, yeah, you know, the unfortunate thing is here in America, like we move all over for our job now. Like I'm so far away from my family. So it's hard. I can't just like go over for Sunday dinner, which may have given me that like enjoyment 
but it sounds like you've been able to like still kind of navigate that with your family living, like in a whole other country. Um, what are like the tips that you have to stay close to your family without actually like living near them? Yeah. So we do have a family chat that we try to talk a lot in. And I think the tip would be respond because I think a lot of people have family chats, but like the parents share something or someone sends a picture and you don't respond. So I think it would be like, be active in those conversations and then share those milestones and I'll send silly pictures to them. And again, that just kind of helps staying connected. And then I meet with my mom every Thursday. And this is something I would say good that came out of COVID was we would have all those happy hours and so on. And I actually kept the one with my mom. So we meet every single Thursday at 5 p.m. We talk for an hour and it's so nice to like get that face to face time with her. We get on Google me and we chat. So I always get all, all the good gossip or, or updates on family. And I think that's an, another really um, nice connection that I've been able to do. Yeah, I think that's great for people to um, implement. And again, this kind of can help with weight loss by helping your mental health, by helping you feel like a connection with someone. And sometimes that can really just relieve anxiety that you have. And then I know you walk a lot too, because you live downtown um, and you'd walk to the gym and you walk all over the place. Is that something you feel like you do consciously um, because of like your upbringing or no, that's just like something you like to do because you live downtown? So it, it's maybe in the back of my mind, it could be because of how I grew up, but it's actually because I'm a terrible driver. <laughs> So we are just trying to keep me off the roads, really. But all, all kidding aside, living in town has been great because I love to just walk. Uh, like you said, I walk to the gym, I walk to my work, I walk to the grocery store if possible. I try to get somewhere between 20, a, a 20 to 30 minute walk before I start my day. Because again, I'm on my computer all day sitting down and I'm not doing a job that kind of keeps me on my feet. So I'm trying to get those steps in before my day even starts. And I think it really sets me up for, for the whole day when I do those things. Great. Yeah. So I feel like to sum it all up, like how to live a healthier Costa Rican inspired, inspired lifestyle here as a millennial in the U S with all the stresses and stuff we have, you're kind of saying, or overall what I'm learning is first of all, um, celebrate fruits and vegetables. It doesn't mean you have to go completely plant-based, but try to cook more if you can, that'll help decrease portion sizes, help just have you better, have better ingredients and know what's in the food you're making. And also make sure there are more fruits and vegetables if you can, and have that like meat, just like accent the food that you're eating. Um, and then also try to walk more if you can, um, how it sounds like people do it in Costa Rica is just have a community of walkers or just have like their lifestyle built around it. Whether you can choose to move to a place where it's going to force you to walk to the gym and force you to walk to the grocery store and stuff like that, or do what Auntie does and just walk more in the morning and be more creative with it. And then also be connected to friends and fam I mean, family and friends, because yeah, you're going on this trip tomorrow. So you obviously have great connections on both sides, which they also did find in the study. So I think those are all really applicable habits that our audience can really walk away with if they want to also live long like Costa Ricans. Do you kind of agree with all that? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Angie. I think this has been super informative and I wish you well on your trip. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited and I look forward to listening to some of your other episodes as well. Thank you so much for listening to the Millennial Nutritionist podcast. For daily weight loss tips and nutrition information, you can find us on Instagram at the.millennial.nutritionist and on TikTok at millennial.nutritionist. If you find this information helpful, please subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend who needs encouragement on their health journey. See you in the next episode.